Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 7727 in the name of John Swinney on Budget Scotland No. 2 Bill. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on John Swinney, Deputy First Minister, to speak to and to move the motion. Around nine minutes, please. President Officer, I move the motion that stands in my name. The Scottish Government, like governments all over the world, has been faced with a difficult set of choices in setting its budget. As I indicated to Parliament when I addressed the budget settlement in December, the volatile financial environment, including record levels of inflation and a cost of living crisis, combined to create an exceptionally difficult fiscal landscape. The IMF's report on Tuesday reflects this and indicates that the UK is predicted to be the only major economy to shrink this year. Against that very challenging backdrop, we have taken decisive action to deliver a meaningful and progressive budget for the year ahead that delivers for the people of Scotland. With the powers available to us, we have chosen to commit substantial resources to prioritise support for families and the most vulnerable, to invest in our public services and to support businesses through these difficult days. A central tenet of this budget is that we have asked the people of Scotland to contribute a fair share of their taxable income and, in the case of higher earners, to pay slightly more than they have in the past to help to create a fairer society, one in which we all want to live and enjoy a range of benefits which are not available throughout the United Kingdom. Whether that is free prescriptions, tuition fees, personal care or concessionary travel, the people of Scotland have access to a social contract with government that delivers so much more to each and every person who chooses to live in Scotland. Together with our partners in the Scottish Green Party, we are working to create a progressive path for Scotland. The 2023-24 Scottish Budget supports an ambitious path for Scotland which focuses on eradicating child poverty, transforming the economy to deliver a just transition to net zero and providing sustainable public services for the people of our country. This Government leads by example in the bold steps it is taking to address poverty in Scotland. This is demonstrated through our social security system, which has been developed with dignity, fairness and respect at its heart. We are committing £442 million in the year ahead to our unique Scottish child payment. This is the most ambitious child poverty reduction measure in the United Kingdom. I am proud that this Government has not only delivered the child payment, but has expedited its increase early and above inflation to £25 per week per eligible child from November 2022. That is an increase of 150 per cent in eight months, providing practical support to families most affected by the cost crisis. Indeed, the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts that around 387,000 children could benefit from the Scottish Child Payment in 2023-24. The Scottish Government recognises that the burden of high inflation is felt most by households on the lowest incomes, which is why we are uprating all remaining Scottish benefits by 10.1 per cent from April 2023. We have also gone beyond the energy support provided by the UK Government to provide £20 million for the Fuel Insecurity Fund to help households at risk of disconnection, continuing this funding into 2023-24 as the energy prices continue to bite. Uh, of course. Willie Rennie. Yeah, thank the Deputy First Minister for giving, giving way. I mean, he mentioned the Scottish Fiscal Commission. He must be concerned that their projections that over the next 50 years, the Scottish economy will lag behind the United Kingdom economy. What plans has he got in this budget to try and deal with that problem? Deputy First Minister. I think there's two things I'd say to Mr Rennie. The first is that in the Scottish Fiscal Commission's projections about tax, they indicate a strengthening of the income tax base in Scotland, which is a reflection of the strengthening of the economy, which the Fiscal Commission expects. And the second thing I would say is that the contents of the National Strategy on Economic Transformation, with its focus on entrepreneurship, its focus on the development of, regional, or, of strong regional economies, is a foundation of the economic strategy that will deliver for the people of Scotland. So, Mr Rennie is right to raise the issues of economic performance because they lie at the heart of being able to generate the revenues to create the fair society that I have talked about. Next year, presiding officer, we will support our investment in ensuring that children get the best start in life with the investment of around a billion pounds in high quality early learning and childcare provision 
and a further £42 million to be invested in holiday food provision and expanding our support for school aged childcare. Of course. Stephen Kerr. From the Chancellor's autumn statement, we know that there are about £200 million extra for the next two years coming to Scotland in the form of Barnet Consequentials for education. But in this budget, is less than £100 million going additionally into education. Where is the other £100 million that doesn't appear in the budget for education? Dr. First Minister. I think this demonstrates a spectacular level of ignorance on the part of Stephen Kerr. <laughs> is Mr Kerr unaware that education in Scotland is fundamentally delivered by local authorities who have seen a £550 million increase in their budget, in addition to the extra money for colleges and universities that the Education Secretary just put on the record. Well, if Mr Kerr is shouting at me, where's the £100 million? Local government budgets have gone up by £500 million and they deliver education in Scotland. And the budgets for colleges and universities are up. Would Mr Kerr please keep up with the budget and we might make some more progress? President <laughs> of Scotland is built on the foundations of our public services. For those reasons, the Government has prioritised investment in the National Health Service and I am delighted that we are in a position to provide over a um, billion pounds of an increase to the Health Service in Scotland. Uh, that provides over £13 billion for NHS health and social care services in Scotland, supporting NHS boards to continue to drive forward our five-year recovery plan. For social care and integration, we are delivering £1.7 billion of improvements as we prepare for the introduction of the, of the National Care Service and will support the delivery of the £10.90 real living wage for adult social care with an additional £100 million. Investment in local services uh, it continues to be a priority and we have reconfirmed our commitment to work with local government, recognising the importance of collaboration and partnership and to work with accountability in delivering high quality person centred public services. The budget provides over £13.2 billion for local government in Scotland, which is an increase of over £570 million for essential public services delivered by councils. We will also invest almost £3.4 billion across the justice system in 2023-24, including an additional £80 million for the Scottish Police Authority. Presiding officer, as we look to a more sustainable, greener future in Scotland, our ambitions to deliver economic growth must be achieved through delivering a just transition to net zero. Over a decade ago, the Government led the way with its inspiring climate change targets as we now work to deliver a net zero future. The Scottish Government will continue to lead the way by investing over £4.6 billion in our net zero energy and transport portfolio. This includes over £1.4 billion to maintain, improve and decarbonise Scotland's rail network, ensuring that this critical infrastructure continues to serve the needs of the people of Scotland. We have provided substantial funding to help households face the cost of living crisis. The, the next year's budget will continue this and will spend over £360 million across our heat in buildings and fuel poverty budgets. Protecting Scotland's natural environment continues to be a priority and we will also spend uh, almost £467 million on restoring our peatlands, expanding Scotland's forests and tackling the causes of climate change and biodiversity loss, all contributing to the achievement of the net zero ambitions. Of course, Sergeant. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. I've just come from an event that was well attended by MSPs um, with the rail unions and it was about getting the right investment in rail. But they said that the government said last March there would be a national conversation on rail, but no date has been set. So how can we make sure we've got the right investment when we're not even having the conversation? Dr. First Minister. I, I'm pretty sure the Transport Minister and other Ministers are regularly engaged in the discussion about rail, but I, I, we'll reflect on the comments made by uh, and put on the record by Monica Lennon, because she's right. It's important that a rail network and infrastructure meets the needs of those who require to use it. That's why we are pleased to bring forward the proposals on um, peak rail fares to uh, remove some of the disincentive to the full utilisation of our rail network. The Government is committed to sustained investment to support businesses and our economy. 
which is why we're providing the Scottish National Investment Bank with an additional £244 million to continue its investment in Scottish businesses, projects and communities. Uh, over the next five years, and this will be one of the most significant investments the Government makes, we will invest £42 million to boost entrepreneurship by supporting start-ups in Scotland through our national network of tech scalers and pre-scalers. And of course, as we manage the transition to net zero, we must ensure that communities are well supported with an investment of £50 million in the Just Transition Fund for the North East and for Scotland. In the course of the pre-budget dialogue, businesses asked me to freeze the poundage in business rates and the Government has been able to do that, which is expected to save ratepayers over £300 million in the forthcoming year, which combined with the transitional reliefs that will be uh, applied to the forthcoming revaluation and the continuation of the Small Business Bonus Scheme will remove 100,000 properties from business rates altogether. This package ensures that Scotland has the lowest poundage in the business rates in the United Kingdom for the fifth year in a row. It supports a package of reliefs worth an estimated £744 million. This budget, presiding officer, delivers the priorities of a progressive government. It provides us with an opportunity to demonstrate how we can collaboratively and successfully as a parliament in the most difficult times deliver support and the best outcomes uh, to the people of Scotland. Presiding officer, I believe this budget represents a fair and ambitious package and I urge all members across the chamber to support it today. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. And I now call on Kenneth Gibson to speak on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Around eight minutes, please, Mr Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A key theme of the Finance and Public Administration Committee's report on the Scottish Budget 23-24 is the need for the Scottish Government to balance responding to immediate pressures and undertaking long-term strategic financial planning. It's understandable, given the current economic climate, the Ministers are focused on the here and now. However, the committee believes that more attention is needed to ensure Scotland's financial sustainability. The immediate challenges of high inflation and interest rates, the cost of living crisis and ongoing demands for improved public sector pay offers will persist into 2023-24. Only today we saw interest rates rise to 4% and interest payments on UK government debt are already an eye-watering £115 billion a year. To put that in perspective, that's more than five times Scotland's public sector wage bill. The chaos of the short-lived Trust Government and the inept economic policies which Tory MSPs such as Murdo Fraser and Stephen Kerr urged us to emulate led directly to the imposition of £55 billion in tax increases and spending cuts amidst rocketing inflation. And as a result, households across the UK will endure an average fall in living standards of 7.1% over the next two years. The biggest fall in disposable income since Scottish records began in 1998, uh, Mr. according Gibson, to please the please Office for Budget Order, Responsibility. I may have misunderstood, but is Mr Gibson speaking on behalf of his committee, or is he speaking on behalf of himself? Because the comments that he has given in his speech so far would lead me to believe it's the latter rather than the former. Well, my understanding uh, is that Mr Gibson is speaking on behalf of the committee. Mr Gibson. Thank you very much, uh, President, President Officer. The Deputy First Minister told the committee that, and I quote... The, the uh, yes. happy to Perhaps Mr Gibson could therefore clarify if all members of his committee would sign up to the comments he's just made. Kenneth Gibson. I have to say, I think probably most of them actually probably would, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the comments that have been made regarding the fall in living standards of 7.1%. And I know that the lady speaking, sitting next to you, who may have wished to if she also wished to do so, is, was not a great supporter of the policies imposed by Ms, Mrs Truss, which you were so keen on us adopting in this yeah. Parliament. I shall move on. <laughs> Balancing the books this year will be a Herculean feat given in early January the Deputy First Minister was £200 to £500 million pounds short uh, this year in his budget. And an update on that during winding up would be helpful. The shortfall adds to 23-24 budget pressures and in addition the SFC expects resource funding to increase by only £270 million pounds in real terms compared to the latest funding position for 22-23. 
That, of course, assumes a 3.2 per cent level inflation using the Treasury GDP deflator. The reality, of course, is much different given that the consumer price index inflation exceeds 10 per cent. Indeed, the Institute of Fiscal Studies a week ago today, taking into account a vineyard financial uh, one-off top-ups unavailable next year, said that funding will fall by 1.6 per cent in real terms, even using the GDP deflator. Tough times lie ahead. Following on from last year's UK Government real terms cut to a capital budget of 9.8 per cent, 23-24 includes a further real terms at UK cut of £185 million, even using the GDP deflator, while construction inflation is, in reality, over 14 per cent. The Deputy First Minister confirmed that ministers are now unable to fund all the projects it planned as part of the capital spending review, and the committee therefore asked the Scottish Government which projects will be deprioritised and how the falling capital spend will impact on its ability to achieve both its net zero ambitions and the delivery of national outcomes. Following the UK Government's November fiscal statement, the Scottish Government's resource spending review no longer provides a level of certainty or a clear planning scenario intended when published last May. With this significant change, public bodies must manage their finances and plan future service delivery. We have asked for more clarity and certainty around resource spending to ensure there is confidence in the sustainability of Scotland's public finances. We therefore seek an updated resource spending review as soon as possible. Professor Anton Muscatelli said, this year's budget protects certain public services and welfare payments, so serious thought needs to be given to ensuring that growth can continue improving the productivity and resilience of the economy in the medium to long term. We often highlight the need to address Scotland's long-standing demographic, productivity and growing in tax-based challenges. The SFC's first fiscal sustainability report, when published in March, will be a valuable contribution to how we meet these challenges. The Government's national strategy for economic transformation must be pursued with vigour, and we have asked the Government how it is driving forward this strategy and how current financial constraints impact delivery. The SFC forecasts that plans to increase the higher and top rates of income tax by a penny in 2023-24 would raise revenues of £30 million on paper. However, when behavioural change is factored in, this figure reduces to only £3 million. Such change is not so much from wealthy citizens switching their tax domicile from Scotland to England or even incorporating to avoid tax. In fact, the SFC assert that behavioural change is more to do with people simply deciding to work fewer hours rather than be taxed more. We saw that with the impact of tax changes on doctors when Tory tax impositions from April 2014 of up to 55 per cent in their pensions persuaded thousands to retire early, an act of stupidity from which the NHS is still reeling. Mm -hmm. Therefore, M MSPs who think that if an additional income tax burden of a billion pounds, say, on the wealthy is imposed, will see an extra billion made available for public services, are deluded. Behavioural impacts are relevant to other devolved taxes too, including the recently increased additional dwelling supplement. We are keen to understand more about the drivers for behavioural change and ask as a starting point that Scottish Ministers, both the HMRC and Revenue Scotland, to ensure more data capture on the behavioural impacts of tax changes. Turning to spending, Social Security alone is forecast to cost £5.25 billion in 2023-24, growing to £7.25 billion in 2027-28. The forecast gap between this expenditure and block grant adjustment is projected to almost double from £776 billion, a million, uh, to £1.4 billion by 2027-28, as Scottish Ministers work to realise their ambition of reducing child poverty. These resources will have to be found from other areas of spending. Health and social care expenditure will grow by 1,117.7 million, with 102 million more for our railways, 81 million from the Scottish Police Authority. However, there is uncertainty around how much might be needed to fund increased pay, and this is a major issue across all portfolios. The Resource Spending Review identified key priorities for reform digitalisation, innovation, reform of the estate and public body landscape, and public procurement. The Scottish Government committed to report the initial outcomes of its public service reform programme in the 23 24 budget and to setting out proposals for the future of the public body landscape. We seek assurances that the Scottish Government remains committed to these aims. The Auditor General said, there has never been a more important time to consider prioritisation in public services and productivity enhancing reforms in the public sector. We seek a clear and detailed response on how the Ministers plan to achieve each reform priority, with milestones for delivering each, along with anticipated costs, efficiencies and savings, and will scrutinise how public bodies are working towards reform and the support they are receiving from the Government to do so. The draft Budget 23-24 has not details on whether resource spending review targets for public sector pay and headcount remain, and if so, how they might be achieved. A breakdown of where headcount reductions will be made and to what timescales would be helpful.
The committee acknowledges the significant challenges ahead and urges Scottish ministers to undertake more strategic, long-term financial planning to ensure future fiscal sustainability, including on public service reform and social security commitments. And for our part, the committee looks forward to considering an updated resource spending review, Scottish Government's public service reform programme and new public sector pay course in due, uh, policy in due course. Lastly, presiding officer, I must comment uh, 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 on bid, potential bids uh, for increased spending from the opposition. Every year, and it seems this year will be no different, we have MSPs loudly demanding additional expenditure across portfolios. In recent weeks, Annie Wells called for an additional non-domestic rate support, which would cost £85 million. Douglas Lumsden sought more and specified resources for local government. And only yesterday, Donald Cameron asked for additional indeterminate funding for the creative sector. Alternatives are fine. Members and parties that demand additional funding lack any credibility whatsoever unless they can explain how much they want uh, and where Mr. that Gibson, additional funding should please come please from. A second, uh, for the point of order from uh, President, officer, it is very clear that this cannot possibly be the speech of a convener of a committee of this parliament because that speech, this speech cannot have been written by a clerk employed by the Scottish Parliament. And therefore, this speech... Eight minutes, which is in effect a second government speech, is completely out of order. Mr Kerr, I, I, I can hear you from this distance. What I would say is that I've already, in response to Mr Kerr's first point of order, uh, said that my understanding is that this was a speech on behalf of the committee. Secondly, I would point out that Mr Gibson has clarified the position for the record. But thirdly, I would say if there are any outstanding questions, that would be a matter for the committee to pursue. Thank you. Mr Gibson, please conclude. Yes, I just, I've just got a slight bit to finish off. Um, Presiding officer, thank you very much for your indulgence. And I would say that this is a mild speech compared to my stage one last year. Um, <laughs> and members across the party divide did, in actual fact, express concerns that uh, even witnesses to the committee did not give funded alternatives, let alone other political parties. So we are on solid ground here. So alternatives are fine. But members and parties that demand additional funding lack any credibility whatsoever unless they can explain how much they want, where that additional funding should come from. Now, I'm not overly confident this will change today, but I live in hope, although clearly I've touched the raw nerve with Mr Kerr. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thank you, Mr Gibson. I'm not sure if Ms Gallagher wanted to raise some point of order. I don't know. What, uh, uh, Ms Gallagher, if you wanted to raise it, please raise it. Otherwise, please don't. to check on the, the timing for speeches because that was well over the, the allocated time, President Officer. Ms Gallagher, what I would say is I'm well aware of what the time is uh, and what I, I, I would wish to point out to members, at this point there is some time in hand and where a, a member takes an intervention, for example, that is duly noted by the Chair uh, and that will be the case for other front bench speakers as well. Thank you Ms Gallagher. I now call Liz Smith. Uh, around seven minutes, please, Ms Smith. Uh, thank you. And here was me last week giving great praise to the objectivity <laughs> and the straightforwardness of the leadership within that committee. <laughs> Presiding officer, I think I will have to seek to correct the record. <laughs> uh, presi Presiding officer, it was in the same debate uh, last week where I thought uh, John Swinney was uncharacteristically rather unkind because he warned that he was going to pay far more attention to what opposition spokesmen had to say on that occasion than he is today, as we set out our political stalls. Now, I'm well used to Mr Swinney's brand of humour, but I thought it was a rather odd remark for him to make, given that he's always jumping up and down, urging opposition members to outline their alternative choices for the budget, which, of course, is exactly what stage one is all about. But can I begin on a few points of consensus? Firstly, by acknowledging that the backdrop to this budget is the most challenging on record. Global inflationary fallout in, uh, from the war in Ukraine, supply chain issues, energy costs, the COVID situation, which, although it's hopefully getting better, it's still not gone away, labour markets having to adapt to post-Brexit and post-COVID landscapes, and, of course, the fallout from the significant changes to fiscal policy in the autumn by the UK government. None of these has been in the Cabinet Secretary's control, and so we do appreciate 
the predicament in which he has found himself. Now, he says that budgets must be established on the basis of sound uh, public finance. That's true. But budgets are also about choices, and it's here where we differ from John Swinney. So let me explain why that is, on what evidence we feel this is uh, supporting our arguments, and, of course, about how we would allocate our rather scarce resources. Now, at last week's uh, business breakfast, the Scottish Fiscal Commission set out its usual, very objective analysis. I hope Mr Gibson agrees with that showing us exactly where we are within the Scottish economy right now. More optimistic about earnings growth and the short-run tax revenues, but warning that when the nominal 1.7 billion additions to the budget are drilled down with inflation accounted for, the real terms effect is much more like 279 million. But the greatest concern remains the fact that the Scottish economy has for quite some time and forecast to be underperforming against the UK economy and that the demographic issues relating to a diminishing percentage in the working population are still having major impact on productivity and on overall tax revenues for the future. Now we know, of course, Deputy First Minister. I'm grateful to Liz Smith for giving way and I, I agree very much with her about the significance of the population issue and the working age population. So would she agree with me, and she mentioned this point earlier in her remarks about the labour market implications of Brexit, that one of the implications of Brexit has been to reduce the eligible working age population. Now, the Scottish Government will do all we can to try to boost employability. But does Liz Smith agree with me that the strategic impact of a, 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 a measure which has undermined population growth in Scotland is undoubtedly a factor that will undermine economic growth in the forthcoming period. Well, I, I, I would say to the Cabinet Secretary that other countries who have not been through the Brexit process are not having quite the same problems. And, you know, I, I come back to the point again when... Uh, well, Mr Swinney's going on about growth. I'm just coming to that point because I think it's most important. And, yes, I do agree about some of the aspects that he's talked about before. But can I just... Um, focus on this, on this growth thing, because I, I do really think it's extremely important. And Mr Swinney always likes uh, to blame Westminster for the ills that we've got in the Scottish economy. And as I said in my response to uh, the budget statement on the 15th of December, I do actually think that that is disingenuous because the structural weaknesses, and this is where the growth point is important, uh, within the Scottish economy, they are not related to Westminster. But the choices that have been made right here in Scotland for all the time that the SNP has been in power. And it's also disingenuous because Mr Swinney has had more money from the UK government than he has been prepared to admit. And I, I, I won't if you don't mind. And I remind him of the comments in the middle of December from the Fraser of Allender Institute, which I know Mr Swinney respects, when they said that the block grant money from the UK government more or less covered the inflationary pressures upon him. Now, Mr Swinney has said on more than one occasion that there is a moral argument for paying more tax because it allows the government to fund free prescriptions, uh, increased child payments, free tuition fees. The trouble is that the public doesn't see their higher tax burden delivering far better public services in health or in education, in transport, in policing, in housing. All they see at present is cuts especially in local government, and a standoff between Nicola Sturgeon and COSLA about the lack of flexibility when it comes to council spend, especially on teacher numbers. Now, Mr Swinney knows only too well that Scots are cumulatively paying more than £1 billion extra a year because of the slower growth. This is raising just £325 million extra for public services. Plus, the higher tax differentials create disincentives. Now, I'm well aware, regrettably, that looking at the books, there isn't enough money available just now to remove all the income tax differentials which currently exist and which we would like to do. But what I would say is that the additional tax on over half a million Scots is due to raise £95 million. That's less than 0.2% of the Scottish budget, which makes a rise very much a political choice of the SNP rather than helping the economy. So what has to be done differently? Let me give, begin with the Scottish Government's proposal for a national care service. The minimum estimate 
from an albeit seriously flawed financial memorandum was £1.3 uh, over a five-year period. And the best estimate from an albeit flawed financial memorandum just now is that it is £95 million for the coming year. Is it not the case that that money would be far better repositioned with local government, who are very much on the front, serve, uh, front line of delivering health and social care services? And we know that for three committees in this Parliament, the evidence is compelling from stakeholders that they don't believe that this national care service is workable. So I think, and I've, I've heard John Swinney uh, virtually admit that, I think that that money should be better spent uh, in local government because they are absolutely at their wit's end about where that extra money is going to come from. And it's having huge implications for their plans uh, for the future. And we know that over the years, the cumulated Barnet consequentials in health and education have not actually been fully passed on to uh, the local authorities in the way that we originally expected. Now, turning to business very quickly, especially to the small businesses in our retail, hospitality and leisure sectors, we welcome the announcement that the Scottish Government is freezing non-domestic business rates. But we also note that as a result of various measures announced by the Chancellor to reduce the rates bur business, uh, burden on business, there will be £222 million of Barnet consequentials, which could well go to a 75% rates relief package. And we don't have to remind uh, the Cabinet Secretary of just how important our uh, business sector is. Now, we welcome the £20 million that has been transferred from the Indyref 2 into additional uh, fuel payments, but we do question why as much as £35 million is designated for the external affairs budget. Absolutely right, an international development humanitarian aid, but we have much more of an issue with the SNP spending uh, on various aspects of external engagement that could be done by the UK. Presiding officer, budgets are all about choices. I don't doubt that these choices are extremely tough, but given the limited resources that are available for us on this side of the chamber, we do not believe that the SNP's priorities are in line with the priorities of the people of Scotland. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I now call on Daniel Johnson. Around six minutes, please, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think right now everyone in Scotland is asking themselves two fundamental questions. First of all, can I afford to get ill because I don't know when an ambulance will turn up to take me to hospital or if there will be a bed for me when I get there? And secondly, that if bills have been a struggle to pay this year, what will it be like next year once the government, uh, UK government help is withdrawn. This budget needed to provide answers to these two big questions, but it does not. This budget has no new plans, no new solutions, no new answers to these big problems. These are challenging times. Inflation has eroded, in just a moment, the, the spending uh, power of government, but challenging times require decisive action, but this budget simply does not offer those actions. Mr. Deputy First Minister. I, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Johnson for giving way so early in his speech. I just want to be clear about his line of argument that he's begun with. Is Mr Johnson saying that should the United Kingdom government, which has proper responsibility for the management of the energy market, fail to deliver support to the outrageous energy bills that members of the public are facing, that the Scottish government should use its resources to support such an endeavour, because that's exactly what he's just put on the record. Uh, Daniel no. Johnson. Let, let me be very clear. I think there is an overarching need to help people lower their reliance on gas. And what I'm talking about is mitigations so that people can actually make their homes more energy efficient. And yet what this government is doing is repeating a scheme that it cut back in September because it wasn't working through a lack of demand. And I'd ask this government, how on earth did it manage to devise a scheme for energy efficiency and insulation at a time of a cost of living crisis fuelled by utility bills and have a lack of demand. And yet they're wanting plaudits for re repeating that very budget line that they cut in September last year. It's a nonsense. Um, so the, you know, more of the same, which is all this budget is offering, won't fix the discharge crisis. Repeating policies that you've cut won't fix 
the, the, or help energy bills. And leaving local councils with a £600 million shortfall will not fix a single pothole, reopen a single library, pay for a single extra social worker, or help our kids learn. And ultimately, the so-called National Care Service sums up everything that is wrong, both with this budget and this government. It's a plan that assumes centralisation will solve everything, a plan that is losing the support of those that work in the sector and those that need the sector, a plan that will cost billions and not add a single penny to the front line. And this is a budget ultimately so lacking in transparency, it doesn't even specify how much it contains for this plan. And for those actually delivering care, this budget offers just 40 pence an hour extra, even lower than the 50 pence they got last year, a 3.8% rise, while others in the health sector are being offered 75 and while inflation is running at more than 10%. This just doesn't make sense. We all know the front door of the NHS is jammed because the back door is broken. And why? Because we cannot recruit care workers to deliver the care packages that, uh, so that people who are well cannot get home. So £12 an hour is not just a budget call, it is a budget imperative to save the NHS. And let's be clear, £12 an hour is affordable. According to Spice, creating a £12 an hour floor to adult social care workers would cost uh, £150 million. Using the government's own figures that they used in 2021, it would be £200 million. And this money can be found reallocate the 100 million in the miscellaneous line item in the central NHS budget, save 100 million pounds by reducing delayed discharge, pause the National Care Service which would save 95 million pounds in the coming year. That's where 12 pounds an hour can be found. It is affordable, but instead this government chooses to pursue a ministerial power grab instead of doing what would be right, paying social care workers a fair wage. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Johnson for intervening uh, for our own intervention. He suggested deleting the uh, miscellaneous line item in the NHS line in the budget. Could he tell us what that would result in cuts to? What services are in that line item? Well, I, I think the fact the member doesn't know shows about the lack of transparency in this budget. The, the budget is there <laughs> to be done and let's, let's have the discussion. Let's have the discussion. And there is a wider context here because there are 300,000 people in the public sector earning less than £15 an hour. You cannot and should not build public services based on low pay. So a budget that doesn't even have a public sector pay policy, let alone a workforce plan, frankly is deficient. But this budget damages local services. SNP council leaders are clear. The £600 million shortfall is going to cause them to look at 8,000 uh, 8, job losses. And the claim of additional funds, they also point out, is bogus, because it's all so ring-fenced that it's forcing finance directors to look at whether they can continue to afford to uh, deliver statutory services. And the reality is this. It's 15 years of underfunding that has caused this situation, not a single budget or a single budget line. 15 years of decisions from the SNP to cut those frontline services. And the absurdity of that is that these service cuts impact health, learning, poverty, transport, employment and inequality, which will ultimately cost this government more. So what Labour would do is deal with that structural problem, scrap the council tax on domestic rates, replace it with fairer, more progressive levies, and the STUC estimate that could raise as much as £450 million to do so. But instead of a plan for local government, all we have is vague promises of a Concordat Mark II. I'm afraid I, I don't have time to take uh, another intervention, uh, Mr Kerr. In conclusion, we do live in challenges times. Resources are tight, but challenging times require decisive action and a clear plan. But there is no plan from this government to deal with the NHS crisis, no plan to secure vital services delivered by local government, no plan to help people manage their bills. And just like this government, this budget provides nothing new, no new answers to the challenges that people up and down Scotland face here. Its priorities are wrong, and that's why Scottish Labour will vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. And I now call on Willie Rennie. Around six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. We have approached this budget in good faith. We are ready to support this budget if this budget is right. Not perfect, perhaps, but good enough. After all, we did reach an agreement before the last Scottish Parliament election in the heat of the pre-election period, so it showed that we were prepared to cross that great constitutional divide.
because the budget was good enough at that stage. In particular, we secured £120 million extra for mental health. And I hope the Deputy First Minister agrees that my party leader, Alex Go Hamilton, has engaged constructively in this budget process so far. I accept this is a more difficult environment, compounded by the actions of a Conservative government that is in utter chaos. We should be able to agree that innocent people should not be left to pick up the bill for this Conservative government wrecking the economy, including this week's desperate economic news that the United Kingdom will lag even behind Russia in its performance this year. Even behind Russia. That should sink in and should terrify us. So much for the great Brexit bonus that was promised. Now, we will continue to make the case at Westminster for uh, the investment that should be coming to the various regions and nations of the United Kingdom for investment. You only need to look, I would argue, at the Shell profits reported today, unprecedented in UK company history, to see why we need a proper windfall tax. And we have also told the Deputy First Minister where we think the money could come from to make the investments that I'm going to set out in my contribution today. But it's worth just dwelling on the performance of the Scottish economy. The Scottish Fiscal Commission believes that the Scottish Government may be losing out on almost £700 million of income tax revenue because of weaker economic growth. It is also projected that Scotland's economy will grow more slowly than even the United Kingdom economy over the next 50 years. Now, that is staggering and should also be sobering for this Parliament here. We need to do something dramatically different compared with what we've been doing, particularly over the last 15 years, certainly. John Mason. Would the member accept that perhaps some of this is to do with a flawed fiscal framework? Will you ready? I, I, I have to say, I think always reaching for flawed frameworks and flawed relationships with the United Kingdom is not going to deal with the fundamentals of the Scottish economy. I am afraid this government has got a perception in the business community that they are not interested in the business community. And that needs to change if we're going to get the skills and the talents of the people in this country to invest in our economic growth. We will continue to lag behind if we try and reach for constitutional grievances every single time. So I reject what Mr Mason says. Of course there might be flaws in it, but that's not the reason why we're lagging behind over the last 15 years and are projected to lag behind for the next 50 years. Productivity is the same. The Productivity Institute said that Scotland's productivity has been very weak over the last decade and trails behind similar foreign countries. Now, this sets the context for this budget. I've actually only got six minutes. I would love to have had more, more time. The, the Liz Trust budget was reckless. Of course it was. Brexit has damaged our economy, without doubt. It's made us poorer. But the Scottish Government have got a tremendous responsibility as well to turn these matters around. The slower growth and poorer productivity in Scotland affect our income, and that needs to change. So let me set out our costed proposals. First of all, the NHS. When the NHS recovery plan was launched, one in five children were waiting too long for mental health treatment. Now it's one in three. One in three from one in five. Young people are battling the long shadow of the lockdown and the rising cost of living. So we are proposing, we are opposed to freezing of the mental health budget in cash terms at £290 million. That will be eroded also substantially by inflation. This comes on top of the £38 million cut from the mental health budget this year announced, or last year announced on the 2nd of November. I'm also disappointed that the Scottish Government is ending, I would say, its excellent work on providing mental health counsellors for students at universities and especially colleges. And I do hope that the Scottish Government reflects on that because young people have suffered greatly through the pandemic and we shouldn't be cutting support from, for them at this time. And we want to see more money for those suffering from long COVID, something that Alex Cole Hamilton has referred to repeatedly. An extra £20 million would triple 
the size of the Scottish Government's existing commitment, and the 158-page draft budget was completely silent on this. We need to have action on mental health and action on long COVID, which would help the fundamental problems that the whole of the NHS is feeling at this time. The Institute for Fiscal Studies says that the Scottish Government has understated the real terms cut to councils, once you take into account existing pay awards and ring fencing. Even SNP Cosla President Shona Morrison says that it's a bad deal. Now, the Scottish Government, and not unreasonably, challenges members in this chamber. If we are wanting more investment in certain areas, we have to spell out where it's going to come from. And that's not unreasonable, and that's why we've got a, a costed plan. Now, the Scottish Government are telling local authorities that they should not cut teacher numbers. Well, I think it's equally incumbent on Scottish ministers to tell local government where they're going to get the money from. If it's good enough for us, it should be good enough for the government as well. So I hope that the government acts responsibly through this budget process, that it is fair to local government, that it provides it with the money that it needs to pay for the teachers to get the recovery in our education system that it desperately needs. And if the government does all of those things, then we will look seriously at the budget when it comes to stage three, because we want to act constructively. This country needs a government that's working for people. So far, I'm doubtful as to whether the budget's going to meet that, but we are prepared to look at it and prepared to vote for it if the government does the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We will now move to the open debate, to speeches of up to six minutes. I call John Mason to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. We face a whole range of issues as we go into the 2023-24 budget. The economy has taken a massive hit because of COVID, and a range of sectors, especially health, are needing both financial and human resources to get on top of things again. On top of that, we have the war in Ukraine with its impact on food, energy and steel production, and the impact of inflation both here and around the world. And it's worth saying that however difficult we find our situation in Scotland, many other countries, including our partners in Malawi, are finding things much more difficult. However, I did want to say a little on another major challenge, which I hinted at earlier, and that is the fiscal framework. I know that we signed up to it fairly voluntarily, although if I remember correctly, the Conservatives wanted us to agree to a previous version, which was even more disadvantageous to Scotland. The framework is to be reviewed, which is very welcome, but in retrospect, I think we can see that we are not in a fair fight. So much depends on how our economy fares in comparison to the rest of the UK, and in practice that means how we do against London and the South East. Even before the Union in 1707, Scotland found it difficult to compete with England and especially with London, and that Union has only tended to re-emphasise this challenge. Ireland has shown that it can be done in leaving the UK and developing the economy in a different kind of way. But that is not an option for us in the next couple of years. In the meantime, we have to adhere to the UK's economic rules, taxation rules, immigration rules, and Yes, uh, L Liz uh, yes okay, yeah. Liz Smith. I'm very grateful to uh, Mr Mason, and I don't disagree with some of the things he's just said. Nonetheless, does he accept that the Scottish Government signed up to the current fiscal framework uh, of 2016? John Mason. Yes, I, th I mean, I think I said that, and I think I was on the Finance Committee at that time, I think, and uh, we, we all looked at it and we thought it was a better deal than we had previously been offered. But I think in retrospect, we are now finding there are some disadvantages in it, which I don't think any of us had foreseen. Uh, so, as I was saying, we're expected to outperform England uh, if the block grant adjustments are to work in our favour. Clearly, the odds are stacked against us and the fiscal framework needs to change. Either the UK has to make it more advantageous for us to remain with them, or more and more people in Scotland will come to the conclusion that the present setup is not working for any of us. Clearly, there is no union dividend. To move on to more of the detail of our actual budget, we firstly need to maximise the resources available to us. And I very much welcome the various measures to increase tax, including one pence more in income tax for those who are better off, and 2% additional dwelling supplement for those who are buying a second home, either for their own use or to let out. And hopefully this will also be a boost to first-time buyers. If it's very quick. Dr. Slumson. 
thank the member for, for giving way. We would agree with me though that the, um, the additional dwelling supplement being charged for local authorities is the wrong way and it should be, that should be addressed by the government as soon as possible. John Mason. I, th I think there is a commitment uh, from the government to review that because in one sense that is money that is going round in the circle, it is public money uh, going and staying in the public pot. Uh, so I accept that to some extent. And I think we should also remember the point made by Professor Anton Muscatelli and the expert panel that while our income taxes are fairly progressive compared to the UK and beyond, our property taxes are not so progressive and yet they are devolved. Now I do realise that major changes in taxes take time, but at some point we need to grasp the thistle and look at changes to council tax, wider property taxes and possibly wealth taxes. Uh, I think not, I'm sorry I've given away twice already, unless the Chair is giving me a lot of extra time. The, the last council tax valuation <laughs> took place in 1991. Uh, since then, I understand that house prices in the richer areas have gone up by more than they have in the poorer areas. Therefore, people in richer areas are paying comparatively less council tax than they probably should be, and relatively speaking, people in poorer areas are paying too much. Councils will decide how much they need to put up council tax this coming year, but the system has to change, and the sooner the better from my perspective, and I believe for many in my constituency. But whatever resources we manage to bring in, we still need to make difficult choices on how we spend. The idea that we come to the budget and just present a list of demands is unrealistic and effectively misleads the public as to what is possible. So I was slightly disappointed in last Thursday's debate when the subject of colleges came up and I asked the convener of the Education Committee if they would recommend a reduction in university funding in order to give more money to colleges. She declined to comment. And then on Monday, I was at a launch of a report on the City of Glasgow College, and I can assure you that Principal Paul Little did answer that question. According to him, that college receives £10,000 for a student to get a degree, while across the road at Strathclyde, the university gets £30,000. Well, I did not investigate his figures, and I suspect there are some nuances to that. However, the point remains, and I would hope that the Education Committee, when it looks at colleges and their funding, it would not ask for more funding for them, but would also just look at that, but would also, I'm sorry, I'm not giving away, Mr. Doris, uh, whether the balance is right between funding for colleges and universities. I think the Finance Committee would be keen for other committees to work on this area of priorities within portfolios. Rather than just saying colleges and universities all need more money, it would be helpful if the committee came back to the government and said colleges, for example, should get more and universities less, or vice versa. I do accept that would require a degree of courage from committees. Sorry, Mr. Doris. And it, I'm uh, sorry, I've taken two already. I, I'm, I think I'm winding up, am I? Um, well, there's a point of order. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, well, I, I, the member should really start to conclude. Now. Yeah, I think it's just Mr. Kerr that misuses points of order. Uh, <laughs> finally, I would just mention local government. Primarily, the debate is about how much cash they get, and we face hard choices between the NHS and local councils. Uh, but other aspects which colleagues in Glasgow have raised is less ring fencing and more flexibility, and perhaps allowed to increase penalty charges by more and similar. So I do commend the budget to uh, the Chamber today, and I hope we can all support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. I now call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Paul McLennan. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As a former Council leader, I well remember the yearly merry-go-round of budget negotiations with the Government. Letters would fly back and forth, meetings would be demanded and sometimes even granted. The Greens would demand more money for local government and the pantomime would close with money being found down the back of the Derek Mackay sofa. Unfortunately, we don't have that pantomime anymore. The Greens' slavish devotion has been bought for the price of a couple of gas-guzzling ministerial cars. Yeah. This is yeah. shameful, presiding officer. Yeah. And because despite the SNP Green devolved government having the largest core grant since devolution, it is local government, yet again, that has to provide more essential services for less. I have long argued that the only way to deal with some of the key issues in our communities is to deal with the problems at the grassroots and to fund community projects that lead to much less funding required further down the line. A prime example of this is our men's shed network, a tiny amount in the scale of the budget but it's proven, to massive, it's, it's proven to massively reduce health and social care costs further down the line. Yeah. By investing in these small community projects, we can address so many issues such as loneliness, ill health, social isolation and health needs in a personal and local way. But the government are slashing the budget to the Men's Shed Network. 
They talk about early intervention and prevention, but it's all talk. Warm words and no action. And I would challenge the government to put their money where the mouth is and fund the men's health organisations correctly. The reduction to funding of our councils and the likely increase in the budget for our teachers, along with much needed additional money for our social care staff, means there will be, there will be cuts to services in our communities. The money has to come from somewhere, Cabinet Secretary, and if not from the government, then it has to come out of the roads, parks, refuse collection, leisure and education budgets. I will give way. Bob Doris. Uh, I, I thank the member for giving way. Daniel Johnson was, was very honest about how he would find more money for councils. He'd, he'd rob £100 million from Scotland's NHS. Where would you get the money from? Yeah. Uh, Douglas Lanson. I'm not sure if Daniel Johnson did say that, but uh, I'm not going to defend Daniel. But Liz, Liz, Liz Smith has already set out where additional funding for local government would come to, and I will come on to that as well. Councils have for many years been asking for a fair funding settlement so they can continue to meet the needs of our communities. The government has continuously squeezed those budgets to breaking point. The COSLA finance spokesperson, a member of the SNP no less, said local authorities had faced extremely difficult financial choices in recent years due to real terms cuts and wider economic pressures. She added, there is a real danger that as well as cuts, some essential services may stop altogether. Essential services stopping altogether, that is quite a legacy for this SNP Green Coalition. Uh, but there is a different way. Given that the National Care Service appears to be dead in the water after key unions were drawn from the process and ministers backpedalling, perhaps the £1.3 billion that has been earmarked for this can now be diverted to the bodies that are currently delivering social care and are struggling, our local councils. To continue to pour money into this dead duck policy that no one thinks is a good idea given the current financial pressures on our social care providers is a disgrace. And this SNP Green devolved government need to wake up to the reality that currently exists. A crisis in delivery and a crisis in care that has happened on their watch. Yeah, yeah. I'm struggling for time, apologies. I would like to turn now to the impact that this budget will have on business. The Fraser Valander Institute has described this as a hard line approach to business, with no additional reliefs being applied to hospitality and retail, as is the case south of the border. This devolved government has further cut £66.4 million to the city's investment and strategy and regeneration budget in cash terms. This is vital funding that drives growth in cities such as Aberdeen. Last week, I spoke about the impact on growth that this budget will have. Zero. This is a short-term budget with short-term goals. There is no financial planning or growth planning. It is a budget that lacks ambition from a government that has run out of ideas. But it is, it is the public that's paying the price for this lack of ambition and lack of solutions, not only in the demise of our services, but in their pockets through higher taxation than the rest of the UK. Middle income earners, such as teachers and healthcare workers, are going to be hit hard with increased tax. Meanwhile, the cost of living is hitting them hard. The government is just making it so much harder for hardworking families in Scotland. But while the tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK sees Scottish taxpayers pay £1 billion extra each year in tax. That only adds £325 million to our public services. This is a result of slower earnings and employment growth. Without growth, increased taxation becomes meaningless. Without ambition, growth is impossible. As my colleague Liz Smith has pointed out, services are not improving. In fact, they are getting worse. More and more people are seeing their bins only collected once a month. Police numbers are falling. The attainment gap is not improving. Our NHS waiting time increasing. Number of social care staff falling. Drug deaths not improving. Growth stalling. Our high streets closing. The list goes on and on and on. The government has more money to spend than ever before. They have more opportunities than ever before. But they have run out of ideas. Presiding officer, in closing, this is a budget that is short-sighted, short-term, and damaging the economy of Scotland and the pockets of hard-working Scots. It will see services cut and higher taxation for many of our constituents. It does nothing to deal with the problems that this government has created and failed to address. 
It will harm growth, harm business and harm hard-working Scots who will be left picking up the Mr. bill Lumsden, by this conclude. failed government. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Mark Griffin. Up to six minutes, please, Mr McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. Context is key in politics and any political decision that is made, particularly at budget time. The Financial Times on the 31st of January quoted the IMF consigned Britain to the economic doghouse on Tuesday. This is the only leading economy likely to contract this year. The UK's growth forecasts were revised down by the fund at the same time as it boosted those of most other countries. Even Russia is expected to grow more than the UK in 2023 in the fund's outlook. They then go on to say the longer-term problem about expenditure and productivity growth persists. UK productivity growth rates have dropped more than in other countries and after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Not at this stage. Let me proceed a little bit. And business investment has not grown since the 2016 Brexit referendum. Now, the Tories talk around about business growth. Scottish Government modelling shows that Scotland's economy and social well-being are disproportionately impacted by Brexit, with Scotland's GDP set to be £9 billion lower in 2016 in cash terms, a 6.1% uh, cut by 2030, continued, to UK, continued EU membership. Yet, Labour and Tories still support and want to make Brexit work. Why does all this matter? Along with high inflation, low growth, this impacts on our Scottish economy and its ability to raise taxes. Denmark has topped the International Institute for Management Development's seventh annual World Digital Competitors Ranking, an assessment of 60 countries. Capacity and readiness to adopt and explore digital technologies as a key driver for economic transformation and business. The UK lagged in 14th. Small, independent Denmark, who have all the powers over economic levers. I'll touch on that later. Families, businesses and our public finances are under sustained economic pressure. Yeah, to get at this stage. Douglas Lumsden. I thank the member for taking intervention. He talks about more powers, but why does the Scottish Government not use the powers that they've got? Bob they, they do use the powers that they've got, and I'll touch on other powers that we should be looking at within the current devolved setup. Now, families, businesses and our public finances are under sustained economic pressure, and the Scottish Government has acted decisively to provide what support it can within its limited Resources. The budget focuses on what steps now that will ensure Scotland emerges from the current crisis a stronger, fairer, greener country. Now, the Scottish Government, of course, would like to go even further, but the cost of living crisis has laid bare the fiscal constraints of devolution. The Scottish Government has proposed changes to a number of devolved taxes, which will raise additional revenue to support our NHS and other public services. The Finance Secretary, I've already interviewed once. The Finance Secretary has set out plans to add one pence to the higher and total top rate tax rates, maintaining the starter and basic rate bands at their current level, and reduce the threshold to which people pay the top rate from 150 to 125,000. Now, according to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, this will raise 129 million pounds. Also talked about the higher rate threshold, which will generate a further 390 million pounds. The Scottish Fiscal Commission estimates that the tax decisions made in Scotland since income tax payers were devolved could raise around about £1 billion more in 2023 24 compared to the income tax policy decisions made by the UK Government. Now, I support this approach, and of course, those who are able to contribute more to society should do. Now, I want to focus on child poverty, and the Deputy First Minister touched on that point with the investment of £442 million this year. Child Poverty Action Group in their briefing stated, we welcome the prioritisation of child poverty in this budget. Prioritising investment to reduce inequality and eradicate child poverty is absolutely the right thing to do. We know that this investment is working. We then wanted to say our cost of, in, uh, of a child in Scotland report analyses the difference between commitments that have been made to make families uh, to make families in Scotland. They then went on to say investment in Scottish child payment and other low income benefits, such as free school meals, free bus travel, funded childcare, and reducing the costs of school days are already having a welcome impact on low income households. The Scottish Government is the only part of the UK to introduce a child payment, which has now been increased to £25, a 150% increase in eight months. It has been extended to under 16s, which is estimated to lift 50,000 uh, people out of poverty. The Scottish Government, of course, would like to do more, which takes me back to the financial constraints of devolution. The Scottish Government cannot borrow to support the day-to-day -day expenditure when times are hard to assist. No, I have already, already had an intervention to assist us through these difficult days. John Mason touched on it. The fiscal framework discussions are taking place within the UK Government. The UK Government has, more, has, has to give more fiscal flexibility, including additional borrowing powers, particularly over Social Security and housing, which are demand 
Labour-led services. Labour MSPs should support this also. I'm just about ready to conclude. President Officer, this takes me on to my final point, a fundamental point about where powers lie. What this Parliament can and can influence. We can't control the UK having runaway inflation, which impacts on our budget not only this year, but next year's budget, and affects every person in Scotland. We can't control how much profits energy companies make and what their contribution is to tackling fuel poverty. Shell recently announced profits of £68.1 billion, a 53 per cent increase in 2022 due to soaring oil prices. Profits when many can't afford to eat or heat. No, I'm about to conclude. Now we know Tories will always cosy up to corporate giants. Imagine, just imagine, if the powers to introduce a windfall tax levy in this Parliament were here. Yet Scottish Labour or Lib Dems won't support and give in power to this Parliament to deal with poverty issues. A windfall tax. Why not? What logic? I welcome these Scottish budget proposals, but we need four full powers over all economic levers to ensure a fairer, prosperous, greener Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLennan. I now call Mark Griffin to be followed by Christine Ga Graham. Up to six minutes, please, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Stage one debate uh, is generally a debate on principles of, of the bill, and while the, the annual budget bill is slightly different, we should still be able to have a, an open debate about pr priorities and the strategic direction that the government plan on, on taking the country with their, their budget. But, President Officer, that has been almost impossible. The smoke and mirrors, the political spin, and at points verging on dishonest presentation of the figures and their impact means that we can't have that debate with government because the response is just to deny reality. The Scottish Government talk in the same breath of the changes to their budgets in real terms, but then the changes to local government's budget in cash terms. The government talk about increases to local government budgets, but don't bother to mention that the extra funding is already set aside for new commitments. Yeah. And we see that so-called extra funding trip. Yeah, certainly. Stephen Kerr. Here my concern that in the way that the Deputy First Minister handled my intervention on him about the £100 million, my concern that that £100 million will not be additional to the current budget for education in our local authorities because of the situation he's outlining. Mark Griffin. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. The, go the government asked us to come to the table and have an honest discussion about where we would cut, where we would spend additional funding. But until we have the transparency, that honest starting point, that is impossible for anyone in this party without the support of government and, and civil servants. But we've seen that um, on Year on year, the government announced extra funding for, for new government, a so-called extra funding trick. Uh, they announced with fanfare a, a new welcome policy. Uh, I give an example, 1140 nursery hours, a, a, a warmly welcome policy, hugely important in terms of getting working parents back into the um, economy, supporting kids with extra early learning um, and childcare. But the funding is announced that it's allocated in year one, then it's combined with the, the general grant, and it never gets uprated with inflation. So the government gets the plaudits, and the council is left um, needing to squeeze other areas of budget to maintain that commitment, or else what we've seen recently is they're threatened with legislation to keep it going. And it's not good enough for government to come to this chamber and talk about shared priorities, shared commitments. If they're shared commitments, then there surely must be a shared commitment to pay for the increase in cost year on year, rather than leaving that burden with local government. And we, as well, we, we can't have an honest debate with the government when it comes to uh, um, ring fencing. When government maintains that ring fenced funds for local authorities amount to just 7%, relying on a strict legal argument when there are billions more in directed spending that councils have no control over. And the, the recent announcement of legislation from the government in response to, to Glasgow considering reducing cutting their teacher numbers shows that 7% figure was always just spin. And when we consider the impact on councils of that announcement, what then does that say to other council staff? That the government only care about teachers, that teachers are the only jobs in local government worth protecting. Now, my five-year-old daughter can tell you that the janitor, the catering staff, the cleansing staff, 
the bus driver, the school crossing patroller. They are just as much a part of her education as teachers, but they are not worth protecting because this government only seems to value teachers when it comes to education. And now all those extra staff that do just as much work, work just as hard to support my daughter's education, will take a bigger hit as a result of this budget. And I am sure they will hear the message of the government's priorities loud and clear. The government also talked about the huge cuts to the, the housing budget, appalling in the year when we have just seen the highest ever recorded homelessness figures since they have been recorded. They talk about that huge cut as just reprofiling, reprofiling of the £3.5 billion they plan to spend anyway. But, President Officer, that has taken us and the public for absolute fools. When inflation is at the highest it has been for years, when inflation in the construction industry was already running out of control before general inflation caught up, it is clear that spending the bulk of that funding further down the line means that it will be worth less, fewer houses will be built, fewer people who are experiencing homelessness will find a home, and it is all just because the government want to pretend a budget cut is not a cut. Shelter and Spice tell us it is a cut. Government say it is reprofiling. I know who I will be listening to. And when he announced his, his budget, um, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, I asked him, what are the costs to the health service of raiding budgets? What happens when people can't access a local authority's preventative services because they simply no longer exist because of cuts? I have not had an answer. Councils have not had an answer. What does that um, do to our NHS? Because, President Officer, all of this amounts to cuts and someone will have to pay the bill. Given the preventative nature of spending in communities and housing, we know that. We know it will be the NHS and ordinary people that will pay that price. Thank you. Thank you. I call Christine Graham to be followed by Ross Greer. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, a budget debate is not my usual métier, but the principle of budgets is not a mystery. An individual's domestic budget will have to balance income against expenditure or require borrowing. The Scottish Government income is no different, except its income in the main is set by the UK and we have no borrowing powers for revenue. Likewise, an individual's budget has first to prioritise payments for necessities, such as mortgage, rent, utilities and so on. Then, as inflation erodes the value of that income and costs rise, the savings slash cuts slash choices have to be made. For some folk now, quite simply, the choice is between food bills and energy bills. It is much the same for the Scottish Government. It has responsibility for billions, but the principles remain the same. The necessities of government are the responsibilities we all know about. The delivery of public services, health, social care, education, the justice system, policing, providing funding to local authorities. In most of these, some 80 per cent of what is provided is fixed in nature. For example, in health and social care, hospitals, all staff, their salaries and pensions, providing ambulances, medical treatments and so on. These are fixed costs. This may seem obvious to us in here, but many do not understand that to cut into one budget to move to another and have any substantial effect would perhaps mean cutting into staffing levels, for example. Then looking across the Scottish Government budget, the biggest slice rightly goes to health and social care, which takes nearly 33% of the total. I don't think we'd argue with that being a priority. The next large chunk, almost 20%, goes to local authorities via COSLA, which then divvies it up per council area under a formula agreed by it, which will take into account inter alia such things as demographics, population, rurality and so on. The Scottish Government does not negotiate separately with each 32 local authority in Scotland. I start from this to put the budget choices into context. Now, in my many years here, I've never known such pressures seen across the UK on government budgets. In over a decade of Tory government, austerity, indeed stagnation, was inbuilt, which was tolerable while interest rates and inflation were low and borrowing was cheap. But it was a fragile UK economy. Factor in the years of COVID, the war in Ukraine, Brexit, and four chancellors of the Exchequer in one year, 
And we have a rudderless shambles of a UK government that had no clear idea or consistent idea how to manage the UK economy otherwise. Why four chancellors in 2022? We then end up where we are today. 10% general inflation with food inflation reckoned to be nearer 15%. Energy companies swimming in unearned profits of billions. So the Scottish Government, almost wholly dependent on its budget from the UK, and dealing with inflation of at least 10%, and pay demands to match that is firefighting, like it never had to firefight before. Yes, I will. Murdo Fraser. I'm grateful for, to Christian Graham for giving way on that point. Would you not accept the analysis by the Fraser of Allender Institute that the Scottish Government's budget for the coming year has been more or less protected against inflation by the increase in the block grant from Westminster? Christine Graham. I'd like to address that by quoting from, I don't know if you're on the Finance Committee, uh, Mr Fraser, but I'm quoting from your report, which you say in your preamble, it is clear from our scrutiny of the Scottish budget 2023-24 that the Scottish Government is firefighting on a number of fronts. That's in your own report. No wonder, no wonder there's little opportunity for long-term planning. And that's the problem. Not only that so much of individual portfolio budgets are fixed, but the horrendous pressures today. Now, I welcome progressive policies, such as free travel for all under 22s and over 60s, those with certain disabilities and their carers, no tuition fees, free prescriptions, free school meals, P1 to P5, and the proposal to extend to all primary pupils, the baby box, the child payment, prioritising families and children. These are Scotland's future. Incidentally, the Deputy First Minister referred to the Small Business Bonus Scheme, where some businesses pay no rates whatsoever. Now, that came into a Scottish Government budget after negotiations with the then Conservative finance spokesman, Derek Brownlee, a big loss to this Parliament. And that Tory group supported the budget and amended that into it. Those were the days when the Tories didn't just oppose for opposition's sake. However, other financial commitments will fall into mitigating harsh Westminster policies and underfunding. No one pays the bedroom tax imposed by Westminster. That costs 70 million. Fuel and security fund, 20 million this year. Just example of millions in mitigating Tory austerity. But there are limits. And the Scottish Government is perhaps a victim of its own success in these years, as we tend to take in the last minute for granted these mitigations. So I've listened with interest to the contributions so far, which always fail to say not only how much the proposal will cost on a recurring basis, but from which existing budget. Neither is there essential recognition of the devastating impact of inflation. Back to where I started. Every household in Scotland, the dogs in the street, know its money is not going as far as before. Savings are having to be made. Choices are shrinking back to the basics. Rent, mortgage, heating bills, food. And for the Scottish Government, it's no different. Just as it's no different for Wales Thank you, and Ms. indeed Graham, you for England's include. domestic budgets. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as has been noted a number of times today in last week's Finance Committee debate, this is by far the most difficult context in which a Scottish Government budget has had to be set. At this point last year, inflation was running at about 2%. The UK Government had cut the Scottish block grant by just over 5% in real terms, and we were rightly describing that budget setting process as the most challenging that this Parliament had faced. But since then, a combination of the continuing damage of Brexit, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the spectacular disaster of Liz Truss, and long-term Tory mismanagement of the economy have created a set of circumstances much worse than what we at that point thought was hopefully our worst-case scenario. Despite the challenges out with our control, this is the greenest budget ever. Scrapping peak time rail fares from September will save travellers hundreds of pounds and end what the Aslev Union correctly label a tax on commuters. 20,000 more children will be eligible for free school meals and £80 million will be invested in expanding school catering facilities so that eligibility can be expanded to even more children as soon as possible. Yes. Richard Leonard. I thank the member for taking in an intervention. Tomorrow afternoon, I'm taking part in a cross-party briefing with Jim Logue and North Lanarkshire Council. They've got a £67 million projected budget deficit. 
What am I going to tell them about the difference, the green element, to the SNP green governments make? And you're doing exactly the same thing as previous SNP governments did, and that is you're cutting services, you're cutting local jobs. What are you asking them to do? Set, wait for a de facto referendum before anything changes, because it's carrying on just as it was before. Where's your wealth tax now, Ross Greer? Ross Greer. <laughs> That is a bold comment from a Labour Party that about 20 minutes ago proposed cutting £100 million from the NHS without even knowing what that £100 million cut would be. This budget... I was referencing Mr Johnson, so I'll take him into Daniel Johnson. Would he recognise that that would be redirected within the health budget because it would go to social care? Ross Greer. I, of course, Mr Johnson proposed that that £100 million would go into increasing wages for social care workers, something that everybody, I'm sure, both in the Greens and the SNP, wants to see happen. The difference is, Mr Johnson doesn't know what he's taking that from. That's a cut to health care services. The Labour Party have proposed it, hear, but they Mr. don't Greer. know what they're actually proposing to cut. That is just comically irresponsible. What we are actually delivering in this budget is funded in part by the most progressive tax system in the UK, by raising the higher, rate of additional, uh, higher and additional rate of income tax and the additional dwelling supplement. The highest earners and those buying holiday homes and extra properties will pay a bit more to fund the public services which are so desperately needed during the cost of living crisis. Scotland has extremely limited devolved taxation and revenue raising powers and whilst we certainly need more financial powers, it would be wrong to just make the argument without making best use of the powers that we do have. So in 2018, the Greens worked with the Scottish Government to deliver progressive changes to income tax. We lowered the tax paid by the lowest paid workers and increased it for those on higher incomes. Those progressive changes have raised hundreds of millions of pounds for public services. But given the monumental pressure the uh, budget is now under and the need for high quality public services during this economic crisis, we need to go further. We might be in a cost of living crisis, one pushing many households to crisis point, but there are plenty of high income and wealthy people in this country who can afford to pay a bit more. Those on the highest incomes can afford an extra penny on the tax rate paid on the top slice of their salary. And those in the position where they can buy a second home or a holiday home can absolutely afford... Yes? Liz Smith. Does he accept, nonetheless, comments from a lot of uh, business and industry, particularly groups like the CBI, that Scotland is desperate to have more well-paid jobs? Ross Greer. Of course we're desperate to have more well-paid jobs, including for the purpose of raising additional tax revenue. But as we've seen, as we see from the SFC forecast for income tax over the next couple of years, the fact that Scotland has a more progressive income tax regime than the rest of the UK has clearly not had any detrimental effect on our ability uh, to raise income tax revenue. As I said, this is a budget that we are proud of because it will see those on the higher and top rates of income tax and those paying the additional dwelling supplement pay a bit more. Between these rate changes and freezing income tax thresholds, about half a billion pounds more will be raised to support public services and to deliver these vital additional interventions like free school meal expansion. And I was intrigued by the point that I've taken a number of interventions at this point. Apologies, Mr. Kerr. I was intrigued by the point that Liz Smith made, though, around the £95 million that will be raised from from the income tax uh, rate increase because she identified it with the National Care Service spend and quite legitimately said the Conservatives wouldn't spend it on that, that they would rather see that £95 million go to local government. Given that, I look forward to seeing the Conservatives vote for the rate resolution that delivers that £95 million of additional funding for our public services. As I said last week, fair pay for public sector workers is now one of the biggest challenges that the Scottish Government faces. And to be absolutely clear, the Greens believe that all workers in the public, private and third sector deserve pay rises, at least in line with inflation. And we support their right to take whatever industrial action they believe is necessary. But with inflation rising above 10 per cent, a real terms budget cut from the UK Government and extremely limited tax powers, it's impossible for the Scottish Government to deliver that level of pay increase in the short term without paying for it with devastating service cuts and job losses. It would cost about two and a half billion pounds. But that's why I think the proposals brought forward by the STUC and Unison are so important. And I do welcome Labour's commitment to reform and replacement of the council tax and the non-domestic rate system, perhaps with what's in the STUC and Unison papers. The last time council tax was in date was before I was born. We have an opportunity in this term of Parliament to deliver the kind of systematic structural change that should have been delivered a long time ago. I hope from the contribution that Labour have made this afternoon that they will join the two parties in the government who have already committed to do so.
Thank you. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Colin Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I want to focus my contribution today on the housing crisis and homelessness emergency in Scotland. And I couldn't actually believe that the Finance Secretary didn't mention housing or homelessness once in his speech. He had more to say about peatland restoration than the housing emergency we face in Scotland. Because figures released this week show that there were 28,944 open homelessness cases recorded in Scotland, the highest, and disappointed the Deputy First Minister is leaving the chamber. But these are the highest records since figures began in 2002, an 11% rise on the previous year. And in a written answer to myself on the time children in Scotland are spending in temporary accommodation, Scottish Government data now shows that 447 households with children included in their homelessness application have spent more than three years more than three years living in temporary accommodation. Let that sink in for a minute. In Scotland today, children and their families are living in bedrooms in former guest houses for three years or more under this government. If that really is the progressive pathway which the Deputy First Minister outlined, I don't want anything to do with it. Hundreds of Scotland's cho children are spending years in this sort of accommodation, which will have a hugely de detrimental impact on their physical and mental well-being. This Parliament should be doing something about that, and we are not. And the numbers are getting worse. A 10% increase in the last year alone of children living in these conditions. Now, SNP and Green Ministers cannot continue to fail to act, and, in, and taking forward cuts to the budget on housing is not going to help achieve this. Our young people are paying the price for this SNP Green Government's inaction. Now, Scottish Conservatives last week called on this Government to declare a housing emergency but ministers failed to act. And it is deeply concerning, I believe, that this budget once again looks to target the housing budget for such significant cuts at the very time pressures on our housing system are increasing, especially here in the capital. And as Shelter Scotland say in their briefing uh, ahead of today's debate, the Scottish Government often talks about living up to the preventative ambitions outlined in the Christie Commission, yet failing to invest in social housing simply damages health and education and will leave children trapped in temporary accommodation for longer periods of time and cost the Scottish Government more in the long term. In yes. Michelle Thompson. We all recognise that there is a massive pent-up de demand and a chronic shortage of housing. Given that, will he support my calls for a massive increase in the capital borrowing powers of the Scottish Government for exactly that sort of project? Miles Briggs. I think the member really should consider what she's about to vote for, because SNP Green Ministers will be asked very soon to vote to cut the housing budget by 16% and £113 million. So I'm not quite sure how she thinks that will have any positive impact. But I would say they need to think twice about supporting this budget later today. Because increasing the supply, and I think I agree with her on this point, increasing the supply of social housing in Scotland is crucial if we're going to address the housing emergency. And developing new and sustainable tenancies with the private sector is also critical if we're going to help deliver the tenancies which people who are homeless or in housing emergency need to see. But we're not seeing that. We need to see a government which brings forward solutions, and that requires adequate, fun adequate funding to ensure enough homes are delivered to reduce housing need and get people out of temporary accommodation permanently. And charities like Shelter in Crisis working in Scotland day in, day out to end homelessness are clear that this impact of cutting the budget will have, potentially derailing the Scottish Government's ability to reduce housing need in this parliamentary term. Presiding officer, just like with the drug deaths crisis, SNP ministers do not seem to understand the growing need now for a direct emergency action to address the housing emergency in our country. I think in years to come we will see them actually come to this chamber to acknowledge this. But I'm saying today this is when we should be taking action, not cutting budgets, because the decisions taken by SNP and Green MSPs to cut the affordable housing supply programme at the very time we are seeing significant increases in homelessness are the wrong decisions. And the, the policies we've seen, especially pushed by Green MSPs in this Parliament recently, are also undermining the potential for the private rental market to help address homelessness and deliver homes for the people across here in the capital, but across Scotland. 
Now, as far back as January 2022, concerns were being raised here in Edinburgh with regards to the capital losing out on £9.3 million of homelessness funding um, due to a bureaucratic anomaly. Now, I raised these issues with uh, Parliament several times with the Cabinet Secretary, and we didn't see any action to address this in the capital. Now, we need to see more resources given to both of Scotland's cities. Glasgow and Edinburgh are at the epicentre of the homelessness crisis, and we need to see the resources they require. All parties across this chamber at the election pledged to that we would work to end homelessness during this session of Parliament. After this week's shocking figures, that pledge now looks unachievable without a total new approach from the Scottish Government. To conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, I want to return to an issue which I have consistently raised in previous budget debates and one which Ministers uh, continue to fail to engage on or act to reform, and that is the underfunding of both Edinburgh City Council and the NHS Lothian. We receive the lowest level of funding per head of population for both our council and health board. That is also driving many of the crises my constituents face and lack of opportunities to find solutions. Edinburgh deserves a fair funding deal, but after 16 years in office, it's clear that this SNP government is to content to continue to shortchange the communities I represent. That's not fair, and it has to change. Thank you. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Thank you, President Officer. This is once again a budget where the reality has fallen way short of the government's rhetoric. Take the, the claim the Deputy First Minister repeated again today that local government has an extra £550 million to spend. What he failed to say is that almost every single penny of that is ring-fenced by him entirely for central government commitments. As SNP-led Kozlov said, the actual increase is just £32.8 million at a time local government needs £612 million just to avoid any more cuts. And that does not return a penny of the £6 billion stripped from local government in the past decade. When he outlined his budget, the Deputy First Minister said, and something I welcome, he wanted a new partnership with local government, an end to the fractious debates about resources and accountability for spending them, a more effective way of working, he said. But I wonder if he's even read his own budget, because SNP councillors clearly have. Cosler Resource Spokesperson Katie Hagman said of the budget, council services will now be at absolute breaking point and some may have to stop altogether. This is a result of cuts to our council's core budgets. SNP councillor Shona Morrison and Cosler president said, the reality of the situation is that yet again, the essential services councils deliver have not been prioritised by the Scottish Government. Just two days ago, the finance director of SNP run Glasgow City Council told this parliament, councils are on a knife edge. This was the worst year we've ever had. It's not a new way of working, presiding officer. It is the same old anti-council, anti-local service way we have seen for the past seven years. As a direct result of the cumulative effect of budget after budget voted for by SNP and Green MSPs, councillors of all political persuasions and none, will once again have to wrestle with the painful choice of which of their community services do they cut and which of their neighbours' jobs do they axe as part of the 7,000 jobs because the war could be lost because of this budget. The debates that are taking place in council chambers up and down Scotland in the next few weeks won't be about what local services to trim, they will be about which services to scrap altogether. Now, I recognise the difficult financial position we find ourselves in. It has been made more difficult by the government presiding over years of low growth. But we do need to ensure we focus what funding we do have and how best we protect services such as social care deliver fair pay for workers and support people through this cost of living crisis. These priorities are connected. We won't protect social care in the NHS without addressing the scandal of low pay in social care. A day really goes by when my inbox, and I am sure others, does not contain another heartbreaking case exposing how utterly broken our care services are. Today, a third of beds in Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary are occupied by patients whose discharge is delayed by a lack of carers. Over 3,000 hours of assessed care not being covered because there are no carers 
to cover it. Everybody except this government knows we won't recruit those carers with the derisory 3.8 per cent pay rise being given to social care workers by the government. The SNP and Greens should listen to those calls for a delay to their current unpopular, unworkable, uncosted national care service plan and use the funding to give our carers a pay rise, actually saving money in the long term by reducing that bill for delayed discharge. And it's not just in social care we need to better focus how we spend our budget. It's on how we support people during the cost of living crisis as their energy bills rise. President officer, it was shameful that the Deputy First Minister, with the support of the Greens, cut this year's energy efficiency budget by £133 million. Given the shameful level of fuel poverty we have in Scotland and knowing that properly insulating our homes not only cuts fuel bills, but it cuts fuel use and therefore emissions. Last year, the government's warm homes funding helped fewer people than it did in the very first year the scheme was launched. Only around half the funding allocated for energy efficiency schemes administered by councils was ultimately spent. But you don't tackle low uptake by cutting the budget. You tackle it by dealing with the reasons why the current poorly designed schemes are not being utilised. I certainly will. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the member. I think we all know that when one particular budget is underspent, that money doesn't disappear. It goes back into other public services. But would he acknowledge that as a result of changes we have made recently, Scotland now has by far and away the most generous and the most flexible package of grants and loans, not only better than any other part of the UK, but much, much better than Scotland itself has ever had, and that the industry is stepping up and making sure that the capacity is there to make sure that people can use those grants and loans. Colin Smith. There's no point in having schemes and grants if they're not actually being spent. They are. They are not, you have just returned £133 million to the budget because those schemes weren't actually allocated. And he needs the minister, and I know he's made some changes, and I welcome those changes for this financial year, but he knows perfectly well that organisations like the existing Homes Alliance want him to go an awful lot further. They want him to ease the restrictions that are still imposed in councils and others for what are currently unworkable schemes. There needs to be more flexibility and owner contribution levels to make those schemes affordable. You need to tackle the utter failure in workforce planning from government to make sure we've actually got the trained workers to deliver the schemes under the new uh, regimes that the government have set. And it also means providing more certainty on future funding, such as writing to councils and setting up that minimum funding levels for future years. And that will allow councils to plan longer term projects, give supply chains a proper pipeline of work and enable them to plan and invest. We cannot find ourselves in the same position next year when households are crying out for investment to keep their families warm, but the government aren't able to spend funds that should be being invested in rapidly insulating people's homes. President officer, Scotland is facing dual crisis as the cost of living soars and social care in the NHS face Thank the you, greatest Mr. crisis Smith. in living memory. Thank you. And I call Michelle Thompson, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, presiding officer. This budget debate already feels like Groundhog Day. Unless Scotland gets many more meaningful economic powers, and ideally from my perspective independence, I confidently, albeit sadly, predict my speech will be replicated in the coming years. The fact is, there is no prospect of the UK doing anything other than continuing to fall behind the economic performance of other comparable states. We've talked earlier of the damning verdict of the IMF that the UK is predicted to be the only country facing a shrinking economy in the coming year and is expected to be the worst performing state amongst the G7, the G20 and predicted to be worse than sanctions hit Russia. But I concede these are uncertain predictions for the future. So let's look to the certainty of the past. Data over the last 40 years, and particularly since the financial crash of 2008, shows UK economic growth has lagged behind the average for large and small advanced economies over the last four decades, and particular over the last two decades when the economic growth gap has widened. Yet small advanced economies of a similar size to Scotland experienced cumulative economic growth that was double double that of the UK between 1999 and 2019. Put another way, by 2019, the gap between the small economy average output and the UK output had grown to more than £12,700 per person. 
This has other real-world practical consequences. For example, within the last few days, data from the UK Insolvency Service reveals that annual company insolvencies in the UK have shot up in 2022 to over 22,000, a rise of no less than 57 per cent. Jobs, self-respect, livelihoods and ambitions destroyed. As Faisal Islam reported, this is exactly the sort of pattern predicted by those who opposed Brexit. But of course, Labour and Tory alike are as one in accepting this Brexit debacle. They have become the handmaidens of Brexit and are intent on forcing the Scottish people to accept it, regardless of the cost in jobs and services. So in this context, the efforts of the... Happily, yes. Thank um, you, Bailey. I wonder, as I traipse around the streets campaigning um, against Brexit, could she explain perhaps why the SNP spent more in the Orkney by-election than they did on opposing Brexit in Scotland? I'm sure, she doesn't, I'm sure she doesn't think that's an excuse. <laughs> I'm sure she doesn't think that's an excuse for uh, standing idly by whilst exactly my point is made about jobs and services lost. Thank you. Thank you. We will hear Ms Thompson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And in this context, the efforts of the Deputy First Minister, acting as Finance Minister in particular, should be applauded. As if being faced by the UK failures I've just described is not enough, the devolution settlement ties his hand behind his back in multiple ways. So let me outline two examples. And I've spoken of this before, the severe restrictions placed on borrowing powers. If the opposition parties were sincere in their concern about productivity, for example, they would be actively supporting calls to give the same freedom to borrow, particularly for capital projects, as that enjoyed by the Westminster Government. And second, if they were sincere in their concerns about the Scottish economy, they would be insisting on the transfer of all fiscal powers to Scotland. Delighted. Uh, I, I thank the member for taking this intervention. The Scottish Government's budget documents put price inflation for the building sector, which I know she's aware of, at 17 per cent. Why, therefore, cutting the capital investment budget at a time when investments are most desperately needed is taking place? Michelle Thompson. <laughs> I, th I think you need to look in the wider context of, of the budget. The point I'm making is that if we had greater powers over CapEx in particular, we could do a great deal more. And until you start joining me in those calls, these are shallow words yeah. when you claim yeah. looking for more housing. And that is the fact. We know um, that the Unionist Brigade will do nothing but deny Scotland the necessary powers to tackle the key challenges we face. And as I've said before in this chamber, and recent reports again from Transparency International, Open Democracy, and, Oliver, and authors such as Oliver Buller of Evidence, there is corruption at the heart of UK governments and key institutions. Leaving aside even the individual records of recent Prime Ministers, Chancellors, Baronesses, and goodness knows who else, corruption destroys the potential effectiveness of markets and puts obstacles in the paths of many decent businesses seeking to survive, compete, and progress. And the historic legacy of Labour and Tory actions of years past continues to haunt government, including local government in Scotland. Now, in my patch, Falkirk Council has a £13 million obligation legacy from PFI. And it's not the only legacy they face. Commenting in 2016, Audit Scotland's Best Value Audit Report criticised previous Labour and Tory administrations for failing to grasp the metal of major challenges and instead squandering money, leading directly to a deficit of £67 million. In such circumstances, the Scottish Government and the Acting Finance Secretary in particular have faced huge challenges with imagination and with a clear commitment to the interests of the Scottish people. So let me finish with an appeal to the Finance Secretary. In the midst of all the challenges, let us work to unleash the contribution of female entrepreneurs who faced historical disadvantages, including cultural ones. It's never enough to look only to government in facing challenging times or new opportunities. We need to mobilise all our talents, regardless of sex, race, age or other characteristics. So we on these bands... You must conclude, Ms Thompson. Thank you. We want to look forwards and outwards. We have global ambitions. We are European. Thank Stop you, the Ms. world. Thompson. Scotland wants to get on. We move to winding up speeches, and I call on Jackie Bailey.
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As ever, the SNP present a sleight of hand budget where their cuts are magically spun as generous settlements, particularly if you're in local government, but otherwise, it's always somebody else's fault. Welcome to the SNP's Alice in Wonderland approach to budget setting. Now, SNP members are keen to tell us that there is a fixed budget. But of course, there are fiscal levers the government can pull. Income tax, land and building transaction tax. Goodness, they can even reform the council tax promised in 2007, but never delivered. But what people are seeing is their taxes going up, but services being cut at the same time. Now, the budget is about setting out priorities. Where are the measures for growing the, on, growing the economy on which our future tax take will rely? Where are the measures for tackling the cost of living crisis, for investing in our public services? Now, the National Performance Framework sets out what the government believes are the priorities, but it's interesting that there's no link with the budget. Spending over £45 billion in revenue, but not linking it to the delivery of your priorities is frankly absurd and out of step with almost every other OECD country. Now, let me start with local government. One billion is what COSLA said they needed to cope with the cost pressures for the year ahead. Instead, the unring-fenced money they got amounted to about £32 million. Mark Griffin was absolutely right to point out that funding for new commitments doesn't actually help with core budgets. The consequence of this is libraries closing, teacher numbers being reduced, funding to repair our roads slashed, and deep cuts across every local service. And according to a leaked report from COSLA, almost 7,000 staff could lose their jobs. A centralising government that has decided to simply sacrifice local democracy and services, criticised by their own SNP councillors, but this government is deaf to their concerns. Let me move on to health and social care, inextricably linked and must be equally valued. The Royal College of Nurses tells us that they want to see fair pay for nursing staff in the budget, a focus on retention and reversing the growing number of vacancies which is having an impact on patient safety. And we agree. But you could substitute the word social care worker in place of nurses and the same applies. The poor pay leading to many of them leaving their jobs in and taking jobs in retail and hospitality because they get more money there and less responsibility. And the increasing number of vacancies and the challenge to ensure the safety of those cared for. Now, the crisis in health and social care cannot be resolved without addressing the scandal of low pay in social care itself. But this budget offers little. The 40 pence pay up uplift is an insult to staff. A social care worker is comparable to a band three nurse. Social care workers got 3.8%. Nurses got double that. The Scottish Women's Budget Group were also very clear that care workers' wages should be set at £12.50 in the short term, rising to £15 per hour, a move that Scottish Labour have repeatedly called for over three successive budgets. The Coalition of Care and Support Providers also makes the point that more money for social care workers, a predominantly low-paid female workforce, is more spend in the local economy. But of course, the Deputy First Minister stripped £50 million away from the Fair Work budget in his emergency budget, so he's shown where the SNP's priorities lie. The cost of increasing adult social care pay is £150 million. This has been verified by SPICE. Daniel Johnson set out several budget lines from which this could be drawn, more than was actually required to meet the policy. Take it from the National Care Service. Take it from delayed discharge. I have to actually say it is a bit rich for Ross Greer to falsely claim that we were moving money out of the health and social care budget. And can I remind him, it was, after all, the Greens who promised £15 an hour to social care workers before the election in the manifesto, but sold out the ministerial Mondeos instead. Now, the Deputy First Minister knows my view of the current framework bill for the National Care Service. Instead of a vision and approach that delivers cultural change, we have expensive structural change that doesn't invest one single penny extra in a care package. It's nothing more than a national commissioning service with no answers about what happens to the pensions of the 70,000 public sector workers who will be transferred in 
or indeed the potential to have an additional 20% VAT cost imposed on a centralised service. COSLA are unhappy. Trade unions are unhappy. The third sector, the voluntary sector, are unhappy. Those with lived experience are beginning to understand that this is the Emperor's new clothes. Pause the bill and listen to what the sector are telling you. Use the money released to fund social care. We all acknowledge that we're living through one of the worst cost of living crises in a generation. And at a stroke, the SNP could end non-residential care charges at a cost of 68 million. This would help sustain older people and vulnerable people, those with disabilities in their local communities. It's in your manifesto, you can do it now, and you can help some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland. Presiding officer, after 15 years of the SNP, their cuts to training places for nurses, their cuts to primary care, their reduction in the number of whole-time equivalent GPs, the cut of one billion by Nicola Sturgeon when she was health minister, all of this has contributed to the crisis in health and social care. Scotland cannot afford to pay the price of SNP mistakes any longer. Vote against the budget. Thank you. And I call on Murdo Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, early on in this debate, we had a bizarre contribution from uh, Kenneth Gibson, convener of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Now, I've been the convener of three committees uh, in my time in this Parliament. I, I had always understood the role of a committee convener in a stage one debate was to speak on behalf of the committee and express the views in the committee report, not to be a partisan lapdog for the Scottish Government, which is what we heard from Mr Gibson during his speech. And I do hope, uh, presiding officer, if that is going to be the trend in future debates, uh, that you and the Bureau will reflect on the time available to committee conveners to speak in stage one debates if they're going to be partisan. But I'll give way. Is the reason why Kenneth you Gibson. and your colleague, Mr Kerr, are not so upset is because people were reminded of the rather ridiculous comments you made post-budget last September, and if you hadn't been named, you wouldn't have had any interventions because last year I was more partisan than this year. If you'd actually listened to the speech, you would find that most of the criticism levied was actually towards issues such as the, the lack of reform etc going forward so it was a very balanced speech but the reality is it was your ego and Mr Kerr's that made you intervene. Murdo Fraser. <laughs> well that, that, that was a second speech by the convener of the Finance and Public Administration but let me come to some of the points of substance that, that he raised because he seemed to suggest and there was a theme coming from the SNP benches he seemed to suggest that the, the economic challenges being faced in the United Kingdom are somehow unique to the United Kingdom. But that, of course, is not the case. It is true inflation is high, but inflation is coming down. Inflation is also high in Europe, presiding officer, and is coming down. In fact, in the month of November, uh, UK inflation was lower than the EU average. In the month of December, it, it, uh, UK inflation was lower than many other European countries. It is true. No, I need to, I need to make this point. It is true that uh, this, morning, this morning the Bank of England increased interest rates in the United Kingdom by 50 base points. It is also true that today the European Central Bank increased yep. interest rates by exactly the same level, 50 basis points. It is also true that yesterday the Fed in the USA increased interest rates in the United Kingdom. It is also true that interest rates are today in the United Kingdom lower than they are in the USA and in Canada. Yep. Now, presiding officer, maybe it is the case that Liz Truss is to blame for what is happening in the USA, in Canada, in Germany, in Italy, in France and the rest of Europe, but I think, frankly, that is somewhat unlikely. Now, presiding officer, let's look at the overall size of the budget. Be um, I will, if the member is brief. Daniel Johnson. I, will be, I was just wondering if how many of those countries withdrew hundreds of mortgage products in September this year, like happened after the mini-budget and Liz Truss's uh, intervention. Murdo Fraser. Well, there are, there are plenty of mortgage products available today, Mr Johnson. You need to keep up with the news uh, and see what's happening. But I want to turn and look at the overall size of, of the budget, because there was in the current financial year, I think this is widely accepted, a record high level block grant from the UK government to the Scottish Government. And for the, the year that's coming, for the year we're talking about, the Fraser of Allen Institute say that the, uh, the block grant more or less yep. protects the money to the Scottish Government against inflation. So the, the Scottish Government has, in historic terms, looking back over the period of devolution, more money to spend than virtually every year uh, previously. And yet at the same time, 
Taxes are going up and services are being cut thanks to the choices they are making. And we should never forget in all this that in Scotland we have more than £2,000 to spend for every man, woman and child in the country than is the UK average thanks to the Barnet formula, the Barnet formula that they want to get rid of, uh, presiding officer. And that is the union dividend that John Mason was looking for. Now this is about choices. And uh, Liz Smith set out the approach we would take that would be different. Starting with the National Care Service, at least £1.3 billion to be spent over the next five years. That is money that could be reallocated elsewhere. We will look at the Constitution budget and the money being spent on civil servants preparing for another independence referendum that is not now going to take place. We look at the money wasted on projects such as BIFAN, such as Presswick Airport, such as the ferries. But there is a more fundamental point here, isn't there? Because we know that the UK economy has, since 2014, grown at precisely one half of the UK average rate. And if we could only just match the rate of growth of the UK economy, yep. we'd have hundreds of millions of pounds extra in tax revenue to spend. And that's a matter the Scottish Government needs to be paying attention to. And that's not just a historic issue, it's one for the future, as both Willie Rennie and Liz Smith pointed out. So we set out in this budget our ask. We believe the support for business, the 75% uh, rates relief for those in the retail, hospitality and leisure sector that is available elsewhere in the United Kingdom should be available here in Scotland. We believe that the settlement being proposed for local government, as Douglas London pointed out, is unfair. Mr Swinney set out how he's giving local councils more money and yet all we hear from them is that they're having to cut services. Yesterday I got a letter from uh, Councillor David Ross, the leader of Fife Council, expressing deep concern at the cuts uh, in Fife Council, saying that uh, already, uh, despite identifying £22 million of savings for the coming year, they're still facing another £11.5 million, rising to £33 million next year and £54 million the year uh, after. Uh, and that uh, is reflected right across the country in Perthic and Ross Council uh, that Mr Swinney will be familiar with. They're looking at a funding gap of £26 million pounds in the coming year. And it's not just Labour-led councils or Conservative-led councils making these concerns. SNP council leaders are making exactly the same concerns as well. And what this will lead to is cuts in services, hikes in council tax. We're going to see school crossing patrollers going, breakfast clubs being scrapped, educational psychologists scrapped, libraries being closed, the cultural offer being cut back. And we don't know yet what's going to happen to teachers, because we're waiting to hear if teacher numbers will be pr protected. But Mark Griffin, I thought, made a really good point. Because even if teachers are protected, that will come at the expense of classroom assistants. It will come at the expense of janitors. It will come at the expense of catering staff, all the other people working in education. And that will be to the net detriment of uh, our young people, presiding officer. So in conclusion, presiding officer, John Swinney at the outset said he was going to take a progressive path. Well, we know now what that progressive path looks like. Despite having more money to spend than ever before, he's hiking taxes, hiking income taxes, we'll see council taxes hiked, and at the same time, we'll see cuts to vital services for people across Scotland. That's what this budget delivers, and that's why we need to vote against it. Thank you. And I call on John Swinney to wind up the debate. Up to eight minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. In uh, his speech to the Parliament this afternoon, the Finance Committee convener asked me to provide an update on the current financial year and the degree to which I am wrestling with uh, securing a path to balance. And, uh, for completeness to the convener, I am still wrestling with an estimated overspend at this stage in the financial year, which is a very advanced stage in the financial year, of approximately £100 million. So uh, we are still working to secure balance, uh, despite the, the steps we have taken in the course of the year to reallocate public expenditure, and that will be reflected in the spring budget uh, revisions that are put to Parliament and for scrutiny by the Committee. Um, I want to thank Willie Rennie for the constructive contribution he made to the debate and assure him that I will follow up the, the points and the dialogue that he has raised as part of the discussions today. Um, he raises serious issues about um, the mental health budget and about long COVID. 
and I agree very much with him about his reflections on the energy market and the significant opportunity for windfall taxation arising out of the ludicrous profits that are being made by energy companies at a time when our constituents are facing such hardships. So I very much welcome the constructive contribution that Willie Rennie has made, and we will try to build on that, as uh, I obviously value the support that is given to the budget by our partners in the Green Party. Ross Greer referred to this budget as a progressive budget, and um, I welcome the contribution the Green Party has made to ensure that the issues of taxation are properly um, considered in this budget process uh, and result in us being able to afford uh, priorities that would not have been the case had we not taken those decisions. Uh, so that has been welcome and put into the discussion. Um, there was quite a bit of controversy. Well, it's, you know, it's not the first time in life that Kenneth Gibson has found himself in some controversy. Um, <laughs> but let, let, me, let me try to be, as always, the peacemaker in Parliament. Because um, Murdo Fraser took great exception to the contribution of my colleague uh, and friend Kenneth Gibson and asked whether members of the committee supported the reflections that Mr Gibson was putting on the record. And I want to put on the record the quote that I was met with when I went to the Finance and Public Administration Committee on the 4th of October 2022 in the aftermath of the disastrous, catastrophic quartang budget. I was met with Good morning, Deputy First Minister, which is always a nice, warm welcome from my friend uh, Liz Smith. And Liz Smith put on the record that day, I put on record that I understand and accept that your job is much more difficult because of the difficulties that have been introduced by the Westminster Government, particularly with regard to the forecast. So I do think it's important that um, Murdo Fraser's bravado is disarmed by the calm a, a, a contribution and, and, and realistic contribution of Liz Smith to the Finance Committee debate, which I appreciated because she was right at that moment. I was wrestling with significant difficulties and I continue to do so. And, and, of, course, and, 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 and of course, I'm delighted to hear more from Liz Smith. That, Liz Smith. Is, that is very kind, uh, Mr Swinney, and in my calm demeanour, could I just ask the Cabinet Secretary if he actually agrees uh, with the convener of the uh, Finance Committee about some of the uh, political aspects within his speech as to whether that was appropriate uh, in a convener's speech uh, in relation to what he was supposed to be like. Cabinet uh, Secretary. I think it's really important that government ministers don't interfere in the business of committees. <laughs> so I shall... I shall, I shall resist the temptation to get myself into trouble, which I constantly try to avoid. But on that subject, I do want to explain to Parliament how the budget operates. Because I think a few members, Mr Kerr, has struggled very much with the concept today. And I think Mr Griffin was a little bit, I'm normally very appreciative of Mr Griffin's contribution. I think it's maybe his cold that's getting him under the weather today, but it's derailing him in his contribution. When we get Barnet consequentials, they flow into the total funding envelope that's available. And then the total funding envelope gets allocated. So what is in here is the sum total of all the resources at my disposal. So when Mr Kerr asks me where is the £100 million of consequentials from the United Kingdom Government on education, the answer is that they are fully allocated in here and as two examples of where they have ended up, there is, well, let, let, oh no, let me finish the explanation because Mr Kerr needs to hear it. He's desperately in need of hearing this explanation. The £100 million of education consequentials 
is allocated to support the expenditure in here, which results in an increase for universities and colleges of £46 million and an increase in the local government budget of £550 million. And local government are the people who deliver education services in our country. So I hope that helps Mr Kerr to understand the situation. If, sir, I said I would give way to Mr Kerr first. I Stephen thank Kerr. the Deputy uh, First Minister for his explanation. In fact, that's exactly what I was asking when I intervened. Where is the additional 100 million? You have now... No, you have... The, the Deputy First Minister has now explained it is in the local government budget. This is the same local government, the COSLA, that are complaining about the fact they have now to make cuts. I'm asking, will the, will the Barnet consequences from education be additive to the education spend? And the answer to that clearly is no. Cabinet Secretary. I think Mr Kerr has demonstrated he has not a single clue about how the public finances of Scotland work. And I'm, not, and I'm not going to explain it again because he's going to have to go and read the official report because I've just given the explanation and Mr Kerr demonstrates he is singularly unfit to be contributing to these debates today. It's absolutely appalling. And the same explanation applies to Mr Griffin's point about the £550 million for local government. Now, in the course of this debate, uh, Mr, Mr Gibson made the fair point that where, concept, where, where uh, alternative choices are brought forward, there has to be a funding source to come from. Today, uh, and I'm just going to marshal what the Conservatives have said, they want more money for housing, Miles Briggs, more money for city deals, Douglas Lumsden, more money for local government, Miles Briggs, Douglas Lumsden. More money for business rates, Douglas Lumsden, Liz Smith. They oppose the tax increases. That's, so that means we get less money. Just for the completeness of the... If we, if we don't have the tax increases, that's less money is available to us. Education, Mr Kerr wants it to get more money. And Miles Briggs wants more money for health. Now, I simply say to Parliament, this is economic illiteracy of the highest order because there is no source identified for the funding resources. Uh, I will give way if I'm, uh, I'm, I think the President Officer wishes me to close my, uh, my remarks. So Indeed. I simply put on the record that it's just not credible to come for, I'll, I'll happily engage with Mr Rennie and anyone else who wants to talk about where we can take money from one end of the budget to allocate to another to support priorities. But what is not helpful to the dialogue and the discourse in Parliament is proposals coming forward that play to a gallery, that play to a lobby, that haven't got a hope of ever being delivered because the money doesn't exist conclude. because of you the must failure conclude. of the economic management of the United Kingdom government, yeah. which is the problem I'm wrestling with today. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Budget Scotland number two, Bill. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. And there's one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 7727 in the name of John Swinney on Budget Scotland number two bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Can we do a suspension of the applause? Therefore, we will move to a vote and there will be a brief suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.